Good afternoon, and welcome to the 10th webinar of the 2021 NACC Immunology and Transplantation PRN webinar series. My name is Rita Alloway, Director of Clinical Research at the University of Cincinnati, and also Director of the Transplant Pharmacy Residency and Fellowship Program. And it is my pleasure to moderate this important session for you today. Today's webinar is entitled, Leading the Way, a Panel on Pharmacy Leadership. And we're honored to have four wonderful panelists with us to share their insights. In a moment, I will turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves, but first here are a few quick notes. If at any time point during the presentation, you have a question for the speaker, please submit your question using the chat functionality on the left-hand side of your screen and send the question to the presenter group. We will take and address questions at the completion of the presentation. There will also be an evaluation for this webinar available at its conclusion. We encourage you to complete this and let us know how we did and how we can improve our webinars going forward. The slides from today's presentation will be posted on the ACCP website in the section entitled Webinar Slides after the presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties during this webinar that are not fixed by logging out and refreshing your internet connection, please make the presenters aware through the chat functionality. There is also a live chat on the upper right-hand corner of your screen where you can get live technical support from any meeting. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you all for joining this afternoon. My name is Lindsay Bowman. I am one of the abdominal transplant pharmacotherapy specialists at Tampa General Hospital. I also serve as the clinical coordinator for the solid organ transplant pharmacist here. I've had the opportunity to get involved in transplant, um, both transplant and pharmacy organizations throughout my career. Some of the most uh, recent or most notable are that I currently serve as the chair for the American Society of Transplantation Community Education Committee. And most recently um, was able to serve as, as the pharmacist on the planning committee for CIOT or AST's cutting edge of transplant, which hopefully you all will be able to attend that, that meeting this year. I have served in the chair position for ACCP, IMTR PRN, as well as a member at large for AST's um, transplant pharmacy community of practice. And then also had the opportunity to participate in the BPS solid organ transplant role delineation survey um, or a task force for the BCTXP exam early in the initial planning phases. So a question that we are all going to be going through as we conclude our introductions is what inspired us to pursue leadership in pharmacy? And as I was thinking about this, um, you know, I thought, you know, I've always been inspired by all of my transplant pharmacy colleagues in leadership positions. And while I didn't necessarily set out to be a leader or assume some of these roles, I really just wanted to, to make a difference in patients, in our profession. And it kind of evolved into such for me. So I feel really grateful to have been given this opportunity. Okay, we're having a, a slight bit of technical difficulty with getting Barrett on the line, but he will be coming um, shortly. As you all know, Barrett Crowther is a PharmD with his BCPS, FAST, and FCCP sort of, um, um, fellowship program. His job title is the lead of the Ambulatory Care, Solid Organ Transplant, and Hepatology Pharmacy Services. He is also the PGY2 Solid Organ Transplant Pharmacy Residency Program Director. He currently works at the University of Colorado Health, but he has, um, has had previous um, experience in transplant before returning, going to Colorado. Um, his previous and current leadership experiences include the AST Transplant Pharmacy Community of Practice Executive um, Committee Chair, of which he is currently serving in a great capacity. Um, he has been a member at large in the past 
and also a training member in the past. And he brings a very interesting and, and um, wonderful energy to our, the COP. Additionally, he's been very active in ACCP, um, the Immunology Transplant PRN. He will be the incoming chair um, and will then serve as, um, or he has been the incoming chair, chair, and immediate past chair. Also, he's worked very diligently on um, BPS, Solid Organ Transplant Specialty Council, currently as the chair and vice chair in the past. And when it was asked of him what it inspired you to pursue leadership in pharmacy, um, he said amazing mentors. And um, I'm happy to say that Barry certainly uh, um, currently serves as an amazing mentor to not only the younger generation, but to me as well. So we look forward to getting um, Barry on the call shortly. Good that was way better than I could have done. Thanks for that. <laughs> that just made my year. <laughs> I'm glad you could join us, Barrett. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Rogers Marks, and I am currently the Senior Clinical Coordinator for Transplant Pharmacy Services at Massachusetts General Hospital. In addition to serving in this role, I also cover all uh, organ transplant areas, and I also serve as the PGY2 Transplant Pharmacy Program Director. Throughout my career, I've had a a number of different leadership opportunities. I've also been heavily involved with the American Society of Transplantation, serving as the chair and past chair, as well as involvement with a number of different subcommittees. Through my role as the chair um, back in, I think it was 2009, this opened up the opportunity to take part in a number of other AST committees, including the Nominations Committee, the AST Education Committee, the AST Public Policy Committee, the American Transplant Congress Program Planning Committee, as well as the AST Fellows Meeting uh, Planning Committee. In addition to my involvement with the Transplant Pharmacy COP, I've also been actively involved with the Infectious Disease Community of Practice and served as their chair and past chair for the HIV and Transplantation Subcommittee. And I'm also involved with some subcommittees uh, working on projects with the Psychosocial Community of Practice. In addition to AST, I've also been actively involved with the American College of Clinical Pharmacy, serving as the secretary of the IMTR PRN, and also serving uh, as a member of a number of the subcommittees within our PRN uh, group. And what inspired me to pursue leadership is somewhat similar to what Lindsay had mentioned, really just the desire to advocate for the transplant pharmacy profession. We I will be honest and say I really wasn't heavily involved in leadership activities before uh, my role within AST and ACCP. So it really is my passion for the field that drove me into these leadership positions. All right. All right. And, uh, I'm the fourth and final panelist, uh, Lisa Potter. My current role is coordinating the transplant pharmacy services at the University of Chicago Medicine. And as far as the, the organ line that I um, champion, it's the lung transplant program currently. Uh, since pharmacy school until now, I've had a variety of roles with different organizations. Uh, most of my early leadership was through the International Pharmaceutical Federation or the International Pharmacy Student Federation, kind of as student became professional. Um, in that, I staffed uh, several world congresses for FIP, was elected to some young pharmacist group positions uh, that's akin to our new practitioner networks in our uh, U.S. professional organization, and then have since been appointed to several hospital pharmacy section positions. Um, in my time in leadership roles with the ACCP, Immunology and Transplant PRN, uh, I have had the opportunity to serve as secretary and treasurer as well as chair and contribute to various committees. Um, that eventually gave way to the birth of the AST Transplant Pharmacy COP and took advantage of the opportunities to help lead that group as well. And then most recently, um, was elected to the board of directors for AST. Uh, that term is now complete, but I'm continuing to support AST uh, on a variety of committees. Regarding the question, what inspired you to pursue leadership in pharmacy? I would, my answer for each of these organizations is slightly different, and it's a lot of different things at once. Uh, with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, it was just pure interest. I 
liked what they did and I was interested in it. So I wanted to be part of it. Um, the, the role with ACCP grew a little more out of my transition from a resident to practitioner and finding the immunology transplant PRN and the listserv in particular exceedingly helpful as I was establishing my career. And so wanting to recognize that and give back to the organization. And then as that grew into roles with AST, I realized the power that organizations can have in lobbying for patient needs, professional needs. And so the roles with AST really grew out of aligning their expertise with transplant needs and identifying ways to help drive those organizations forward. So it's it's a lot of different reasons. Um, thank you so much for, for um, the introduction of all the panelists. It, it's very impressive, the accomplishments that you have, and we look forward to you sharing that with the group. But for our first question, really, how do you define leadership? And um, I want to open that up to um, all the panelists. And um, Lindsay, if, if you would like to start, yeah, of course. You know, when I think about the definition of leadership, things that come to mind are strategy, innovation, uh, powerful ideas, creativity. But really, when I think about what has resonated with me is Brene Brown's definition of how she defined leadership in one of her books. And that is the willingness to step up, put yourself out there and lean into courage. And really, I feel like that's how I have, you know, gone into leadership and kind of gotten in these positions and in these roles is doing exactly that and kind of putting myself out there. Thank you, Lindsay. Barrett, would you like to comment, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree. I uh, did the, the classic role of what one of my former ID preceptors told me to do, and that was go to Lord Google. And Lord Google told me that leadership was uh, motivating a group of individuals to a common goal. Um, I, I'm not actually a huge fan of that definition. I think it's surrounding yourself with a group of very motivated individuals and empowering them to really do their best um, to reach that common goal. And I think that's a lot of what we've done within transplant pharmacy um, over the past 10 decades plus. Um, to, to really reach that goal of being recognized as a specialty, um, all, everything we've achieved through the national organizations that have just grown immensely. I mean, you look at our numbers alone of transplant pharmacists, um, and, and the, the community has just exploded and the acceptance within um, the, the transplant realm, the pharmacy realm has just uh, grown immensely as well. So, and it's really the, the panelists I'm, I'm sitting with today that are, are responsible for that. So to that, I thank them. Kristen? I would agree with everything that both Barrett and Lindsay said. I would say one of the other factors, I think that many of us in, in qualities that we all have is just a passion for the field and a passion to drive that vision forward. I think when you look at all transplant pharmacists, most of us are very invested in our patient care, our common goals, and what we want to see the profession look like in the future. So I think you know many of our leaders do have that passion and use that as a drive uh, to achieve our, our goals. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I think I agree with everything that's been said, um, leading in, but also think of leadership as two different dimensions, basically. There's the formal leadership, like uh, what Barrett had outlined, like setting direction, building an inspiring vision, creating something. But there's also the informal leadership, like you don't need to be a manager or an elected leader in order to be a leader. So just being a great example for your colleagues, being, as they say, the change you want to see, uh, living your life in the way that you think that that it that others should or hopefully follow you. So I would mention both the formal and the informal leadership. Thank you. Thank you. So as we move to the next question, um, I'd like to direct this to Lindsay and Barrett. And um, Barrett, if you want to plan to start. Um, describe the importance of developing relationships in pharmacy leadership. Yeah, I think it's absolutely key. Even within the, so within the transplant pharmacy community, we are a small 
tight knit group, of course. So regardless of what leadership role you take, uh, it's going to be noticed and acknowledged just your, your willingness to, to, to help contribute to the society as a whole. Um, but also it's important to develop those relationships even outside of transplant pharmacy with our other pharmacy colleagues, uh, physician colleagues, social work colleagues, and so forth, uh, I think is, is really key. And that's how we've leveraged ourselves to, to have such strong roles. I mean, the, the other thing that really stands out to me, even over the past month, are all the job openings the new job openings for transplant pharmacists um, is never, I don't think in the past 10 years I've seen anything quite like that. And that's a, a testament to true leadership within the field, being able to acknowledge uh, the worth of the transplant pharmacist and uh, benefit the various uh, health systems and benefit this, the patients the, the most. Uh, that's very insightful. The proof is in the pudding, correct? Um, Lindsay? Yeah, I agree um, 100% with Barrett and everything that he said. You know, relationships are everything, and, and building those relationships and forming those relationships early are really important. And, you know, like Barrett mentioned, with everybody um, within the multidisciplinary team, as well as your transplant pharmacy colleagues, you know, these relationships that you build are going to follow you throughout your professional career through collaboration and research, scholarship, asking clinical questions. You know, I, I text, you know, some of you things that are like, hey, we have this patient emailing questions. What would you guys do in this particular instance? Um, and I think having those relationships and those communications, um, you know, with all of those different groups early are, you know, really important, not to mention just friendship. You know, I think that, you know, everybody that I can see in this panel is here, I would consider a good friend of mine. And it goes, you know, beyond that to many different transplant pharmacists throughout the country that I never would have had the opportunity to really become friends with had I not built those relationships, a lot of times through professional organizations. You call them friends, sometimes I call them therapists. <laughs> we all are, are walking a very similar line, and I think it's wonderful that we can share these experiences with each other. So as we move on to the next question that I'll direct to Kristen and then Lisa, um, what barriers did you encounter in obtaining leadership positions or in your experience in general? How did you overcome these barriers? So this was kind of a tough one. I feel like in these leadership roles that I've had, there haven't been, okay. you know, a ton of barriers. Uh, wait, wait. Let me inter interrupt you for just a second. Yes. Um, I think we skipped one question. No, we didn't. Let's go on. Go ahead. Go ahead with this. <laughs> I think right. in... No, that's totally fine. In the one um, leadership position, I remember I had actually gone up for the board of directors a couple of years back. And I personally took it, I, I, it's not that I took it personal, personally that I didn't uh, win the position, but I felt like I almost, you know, had a lot of weight on my shoulders for our profession. And I feel like that's important to really separate yourself from those kind of things and make sure that um, you're passionate about your, your vision and kind of not be too hard on yourself when things don't go the way you may kind of expect it. Um, there's, you really shouldn't have high expectations. I mean, any vote is a vote. So it's really just being open to kind of how things play out. Um, thank you. Lisa, um, what do you have to add? So I actually, I have a little anecdote, a little story I want to tell. So as a pharmacy student, I was really interested in a career with an international focus. I thought it sounded cool. Uh, I thought it sounded interesting. So I thought there was a time when if you asked me what I was going to do with, my, with myself, I was going to be like an international something or other. So I grabbed opportunities at the time. I went to IPSF congresses. I um, rotated an international rotation in school. I became the student exchange officer for the IPSF exchange program for the U.S. and eventually realized that this was like for me in terms of my own leadership, this is a parallel, but it was this moment I realized that you 
international was what I was going after, but it's an adjective, not a noun. And nobody's going to care that you have an interest. People are going to care about what you can bring to the table. And at the time, all I brought to the table was interest. And so I realized that if I really wanted that, I was going to have to create a skill in myself that was worthy of being internationally known or, you know, interesting. So that was like a realization for me. And as it, as it relates to leadership, I think the same parallel is important to understand that elected leadership roles are not given based on merit. They're not awards. They're work heavy positions and they are often given to people who come with a vision that aligns with what that organization needs at that moment in time. So I guess the, the parallel of the story is uh, have the skill and bring the skill to the organization as opposed to, you know, viewing the position as the end game in itself. And I just comment there, you know, just like you don't have isolated time for um, research or, or other activities, you don't have isolated time for your leadership desires and you have to create those. And everyone on the panel has certainly done a wonderful job with that. Um, Barrett, I'd like to um, address this question to you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I echo what Lisa says. It's the not, in, not getting discouraged. I, I think most of the, the national positions I applied for, I may not have necessarily gotten first go around. Um, and it's that persistence and uh, really trying again. Um, I was fortunate enough to be the first um, back when AST, the Transplant Pharmacy Executive Committee had uh, tr true trainee members. Um, I, I was on that executive committee. So several of the members on the, the call right now were my mentors for that. Um, and, and help me realize truly what it means to be a leader um, within the field and what is necessary and what the field's looking for. And I think really just becoming involved really in any position um, will help uh, position you to do that. But I, I think that the, the true barriers have been, it's just ensuring that you don't get discouraged if you're not necessarily elected for a position or don't get the position that you're you're gunning for because as Lisa said, the, the end game isn't getting the position, it's the, the work that goes into it. Um, and, and there's several different avenues to do that, especially with the expansion of our national societies, all the various committees um, that have done just wonderful things uh, to I expand our profession. Um, I mean, yeah, not gonna give specific examples because there's too many. <laughs> yeah, that, that's very insightful. Thank you, Lindsay. I think one of the biggest barriers that many of us face, especially early on, is our own self-doubt. You know, I'm too new of a practitioner. I won't have anything to add. I won't do a good job. I don't even know enough about this organization or this committee to even know what it would entail or what I could bring. And I think, you know, the advice that I would give and what I maybe wish I would have known or thought about earlier in my career was, you know, join these sub subgroups, join these work groups, committees, and then learn. That's when you're going to learn about what really goes on um, within those committees and kind of the bigger overarching goals um, of, the, of the committee or of the organization. And thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I'd like to echo, too, you know, in my role as leadership, you really are amazed at how much these organizations do and you don't fully appreciate or realize until you're involved in them and you want to get the message out as best you can. And, and we all encourage that. So as we move on to the next question, I will um, direct it to um, Barrett and then Lindsay. Um, to what extent does your place of employment support your leadership in external organizations? Lisa, I mean, I mean I'm sorry, ba um, Barrett, yeah, no, I, I, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, a, an amazing manager who really had, and team uh, that highly uh, values uh, involvement on a national level, um, state level, local level, et cetera. So we really work together as a team to ensure that there's time allotted 
uh, to do various, whether it be research projects, leadership. Yes, it does flow over into the weekend sometimes, um, et cetera, especially depending upon involvement. But I, I think it's really not just an, an individual, a manager or an individual that can help empower. It's a huge help, but it's really working with the, the team themselves and having that uh, value for leadership within the team. Um, and the, the past uh, my current institution and previous one highly valued that and I worked with amazing team members um, that helped we helped to elevate each other. Thank you. Um, Lindsay? Yeah, you know, Rita, you kind of mentioned it, you know, similarly to research and other scholarly activities, a lot of what we do or some of what we do from a professional organization standpoint does cut into your own time, you know, nights and weekends. Uh, but I think it is really good. And I've also been fortunate to work at institutions that have valued, you know, professional, national involvement in professional committees that have allowed, if nothing else, you know, professional leave to attend some of these conferences or to, you know, present at the fellows conference and not have to use my own ATO. Um, you know, sometimes travel, travel stipends, uh, usually before COVID, but, you know, providing funding to attend these meetings, but at least the time. And, you know, I guess but we all know, and those that are involved in even just the, the work groups or the subcommittees within these organizations know that there's a lot of meetings, right, throughout the work day, um, conference calls and hour here, hour there. And those are times and the flexibility of my job, because those are during work hours that I am able to do that. And so I really owe it to my institution to allow that flexibility and that ability. No, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, just as a as a note, um, Kristen or Lisa, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? The one thing I'd like to add is that um, my institution supports it in a in the way that they're proud and glad to have their staff members take on leadership roles, um, and they do offer the flexibility with my work in order to attend meetings and attend um, events. But I, I acknowledge, I'm very aware that when I'm gone, my work has to be covered and that trickle down effect often lands on my colleagues. So I also just want to recognize and appreciate the people that work with me <laughs> because I couldn't, you know, attend meetings if somebody's not there to take care of the patients while you're gone. So the leadership roles that I've had, uh, I think are a testament to my whole team, not just me as an individual, because we're able to make the hospital continue to run while trying to build influence in these other domains. I couldn't agree more, Lisa. It's having that support that is super important. I would say also for my profession in my uh, current center, they're very supportive. We've had a number of prior AST presidents, so they really advocate for heavily heavy involvement within AST. Um, I think the other important piece too, at least with some of our jobs, you may not have that time during the day, but making time and if it's a priority, ensuring that you have that bandwidth to kind of work on that kind of stuff on, on nights and weekends. Yes, that's again, very insightful. Thank you guys. So um, as we move on to the next question, um, we'll direct these to um, Kristen first and then Lisa. How do you evaluate leadership abilities in potential candidates for a pharmacy leadership position within your organization? Thanks, Rita. So I I like people to tell stories and kind of get a feel for kind of their different environments and what kind of informal and formal leadership opportunities they've had. I mean, obviously, if they have a list of committees that they're involved with or national leadership positions, understanding kind of what their vision was when they were part of that that role um, and informal leadership opportunities, being able to just provide some insight on what kind of informal leadership they had. I also always like to ask about challenges 
um, or techniques that they've used in challenging situations and challenging um, group dynamics. Those are usually pretty insightful. And also the question of if you had to do anything over, uh, what would you do over and why? And just getting a, a feel for their ability to self-reflect. That's very good. Lisa. When I, yeah, when I'm looking at candidates, um, and this is, I'd say most commonly in my example, this is candidates for our PGY2 transplant residency, though it also applies to candidates for positions, uh, candidates for elected offices. Um, the Especially for the PGY2 candidates, what I'm always looking for in a CV review before I actually meet the candidate is just evidence that that person has done something that wasn't assigned or expected of them. So I look for, you know, did they, are they a members of any organizations and in that membership, did they, does it appear like they volunteered for anything? Did they do anything that didn't appear to be like an assignment or a mandate? Um, Cause I think that reveals a lot about individual motivation uh, and then in discussing, like in interviews and meeting the candidates, I'll explore that a little bit more just to see what was it that inspired that action or what kind of lessons did the candidate learn from that involvement just to get a better sense of, of what they were going after. No, that's great. Um, we have a little bit of time buffer right here, and I'll just add one comment. Um, it's important to me to look at people and see if they're able to identify a problem, come up with a solution, and, and implement it. And also, if it is a solution that you've implemented and it is something that is um, maintained by your institution after you're gone, for example, in the cases of the residents and things like that, in my mind, that shows true leadership skills. You have the vision um, of the need, you have the insight into how you would make the change, and then you can implement it in a positive way. So um, I would just um, go ahead and share that. So the next question, I will probably um, open it up to all the panelists. What resources such as articles, books, podcasts, people, et cetera, helped you develop or expand your leadership skills? And um, did these resources change over time? So, Lindsay, would you like to start? Sure. You know, I think early on, it's your mentors, at least for me, it was probably the biggest impact or most influential with regard to leadership. So, starting with PGY1, PGY2 residency, preceptors, mentors, RPDs. And then in my first job, you know, really it was probably Dan Brennan and, you know, being one of my biggest mentors, huge farm, as you, as you all know, Rita, uh, we just had a virtual uh, social not too long ago with you and Dan and, you know, having that, that um, advocacy that for transplant pharmacists and him getting me involved with various things and giving me those opportunities, I think, early in my career. And just seeing the way that, that other people in both my organization at Barnes Jewish at the time, as well as in pharmacy organizations kind of ran things and taking different pieces here and there that I felt like would, would be useful or, or worked really well to lead that individual group. At Tampa General, we actually have a PGY2 book club every year in which we read a leadership book as a group. Uh, so it's been pretty cool. We've read a few a few books together. Start with Why was the most recent one last year. But I feel like those have been really insightful and really cool to see, you know, to talk about our positions with the residents, but then also have them ask questions and kind of learn what we've read um, from a leadership standpoint and kind of tie in all of that information as a group. Now that's a, that's a very um, beautiful take home point. And I think that, you know, since we are on a call with probably all pharmacists, I would just like to echo what Lindsay said here. Um, leadership is not, um, your leadership skills cannot be developed 
just from pharmacists. As, as Lindsay talked about, there are a variety of other professional people around you. When you see a good leader, you know, you know, and um, focus on what they do do well and replicate it and, and pick some of them to um, be your mentors for the future. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a pharmacist. So thank you very much, Lindsay, for that insight. Um, Barrett, would you like to comment? Yeah, I definitely echo what Lindsay said. And uh, I think in my past institution, current institution, working closely with the transplant administrator um, has been extremely valuable as well, um, helping uh, roll out various initiatives, working closely with pharmacy leadership as well on said initiatives. So I, I think that's from a personnel standpoint. I was thinking about this question in books, and honestly, I was like, I don't really read a lot of books. Um, I read a lot of children's books, though, with my daughters. So I was trying to think of some great children's books that would be quick reads, especially if there's residents on here. I mean, re reading a whole novel about leadership might get a little challenging with the, the time you have allotted. So um, some of the books are not as short, but my daughters are now reading Harry Potter. I mean, Hermione is definitely the leader in that, that book series. She doesn't get enough credit. Chronicles of Narnia, got a bunch of great leaders in that series. And then um, not necessarily leadership, but I think uh, from a self-care standpoint, it's important to, to really value self-care. And I don't mean like just going for walks on the beach, but truly valuing, valuing your uh, emotional state uh, and reflecting upon that. Uh, there's a book called The Good Egg, it's a fabulous children's book, and, and really, I, I think it's uh, taught my daughters a lot of uh, emotional maturity. Um, so those would be my three children's books rec recommendations uh, surrounding leadership. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. I got, I took a picture of another book. Oh man, I don't think it's going to, guys. Am I not, not gonna work? Anyways, there's a book called Slow. I personally have not read, but it is highly recommended by one Patrick Clem, who I share an office with, who is a, just, <laughs> he is one of my role models in transplant pharmacy. Um, but flow uh, discusses flow state and the importance of truly getting in the flow state to, to accomplish tasks. I think uh, in the current state of things, we, we have several interruptions throughout the day, whether it be epic messages in 20 different ways, text messages, phone calls, et cetera. But I, I think from a productivity standpoint and also relaxation standpoint, it's important to, to truly get in that state of flow with what makes you happy, what makes you productive. So whether it's music, uh, uh, watch it, like enjoying live music, producing music, et cetera, uh, you name it. Um, I, I've heard shuffling does it for some people too, getting in flow state, so. That's a good activity, but uh, it's flow. I cannot pronounce the, the author's name, but I'll, I'll put it in the, the chat uh, and fully type it out. But it, it's highly recommended by several of my colleagues. It's on my to-do list. Okay, Lisa, before we go to you, I'd like to address some of the attendee questions. And I think that this would be expanded specifically back to Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, there was interest in expanding the book club to include other programs. So I won't put you on the spot to respond to that right quickly right now. But I think that, you know, that's something that we may consider in the future. And um, um, there's also another question. Is there anything about your leadership path you would change? So um, I I'll take a stab. Um, I, I guess um, I made a specific determination to not get heavily, heavily involved in leadership until after um, my son could drive, essentially. You know, I was involved in some um, lower level leadership, but I didn't make that change, make that decision to leadership roles that would require a lot of travel until after that time point in my life. Um, and, um, you know, it works for some, it doesn't work, work for others. But I think that you have to balance the requirements of the leadership roles that you're taking on with what your other responsibilities are, whether they're personal or um, um, professional. 
so I'd like to, um, do any of the other um, panelists have a comment on how you would change your leadership path if you could? For myself, I wouldn't change anything. Be I, I'm not trying to pretend like my leadership path has been all success stories. It has not. There are definitely some great moments. There are some pretty embarrassing and some ugly moments. So, But all of them have fed into forming uh, who I've become. So I, I don't think you can develop if you don't have both successes and failures. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. No, I don't feel like I would really change anything either. I think, you know, at times maybe I've overcommitted a little bit much. Um, so ensuring that you know when to say no, I think is important. Um, if anything, it might be one or two things that I probably just should have said no to. Very important comment. Okay, so let's move uh, on. To I the definitely next echo question. that as well. Yeah. So um, let me move on to the next question that we'll direct to Kristen and Lisa. Um, how do you distinguish between management and leadership? And are they one and the same? Kristen? Sure. So excellent question. Honestly, coming into my current role um, was kind of the first management type position. I always thought because I had a lot of leadership experience that was going to kind of serve as a foundation, but quickly realized management and leadership are really definitely not the same thing. I think with regards to management, there's a lot more, you know, people things to deal with as well. And your your focus more so is on kind of setting up a, a system that works and consistency. Whereas leadership, I think, is really having that vision, passion, and kind of knowing where you want to where you want the group to go and being able to get the group kind of on board with that that vision. And I, I think that managers, by nature of that title, are leaders, but not all leaders are managers. I think there are some amazing mm -hmm. leaders that lead from the front line uh, and lead by example and lead by influence. Um, I view it as managers manage the day-to-day -day tasks or needs of whatever organization they're appointed with. But leaders inspire behaviors. And so I think that um, that's a really leadership is something that's bigger and a little more unique than management. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're going to move on to the next um, our final two questions and they will be directed to all the panelists. And we'll start with um, Lindsay first. What advice do you have for new practitioners looking for leadership opportunities? Get involved, you know, get involved with a work group, a committee, something that is of interest to you, maybe something that you don't know anything about and you want to learn more about it. And, you know, during those work group calls, speak up, even if it's unmuting and saying, I agree early on, just something, um, trying to think of something to add to the conversation, whether you think it's you know, a very small point could be something that's very big and evolves into something more. And I think the one of the biggest things that we've talked about a little bit with regard to to maybe some of the what you would have changed um, in your leadership path is when you get involved and you show up, make sure you're able to follow through. So not over committing, making sure that if you are going to volunteer for something that you follow through with it. Very good, thank you. Barrett? Yeah, I was going to say the exactly same thing. Uh, I think it, there's so many opportunities to be involved uh, what on the national level, state level, et cetera. But um, if you are going to be involved, definitely follow through and commit. It's going to be noticed if you don't necessarily follow through um, with something you've already committed to. So um, kind of take it one step at a time and really know that regardless of which committee you might be involved in, that it's extremely valuable, the work that you're doing, and it's greatly appreciated, uh, but it is important to, to follow through. I think we all have a lot of commitments going on. So it's a balance of, hey, what's going on in your life, what's going on with work, but also the, these volunteer activities as well. 
Great, Kristen. I think one of the important things is to figure out what your area of interest is, connect with those people who are in that area and kind of learn how they navigated their leadership path. If by chance, you know, there are not opportunities in that area that you're interested in and you know of other colleagues within your professional network or even at work, say you have nephrologists that are on the education committee or other AST level committees. I think now with everything being on Zoom, it's even more feasible to kind of sit in the room. If there's somebody who you're thinking, who you envision as a strong leader, ask if you might be able to sit in their office, listen in, see how they lead that group and see what the the culture of that group is. What is their vision? Is that something you truly see yourself being able to do? Um, inviting, I think, you know, other people into your network, like bringing students in, so you're exposing them to these things as well. And I would add, just start with low hanging fruit. Um, I wouldn't go for like a big role right off the bat, um, but get involved in a some any small way with one of the work groups or one of the committees. Um, get to know it, contribute. Like Lindsay had said, don't be a silent passenger on those on those committees. Speak up, even if it's just endorsing the conversation and agreement. Um, I remember as a transplant pharmacy resident, my RPD at the time, soon after I finished, I was invited to be on an um, advisory board. I don't remember what the theme was at the time, but I thought it was cool. And I was like, oh, look, this is awesome. Look at this opportunity coming. And I remember him telling me, it's nice. However, if you accept that invitation, like it's not, you can't sit there quietly. Like you've got to show up. You've got to bring opinions. They're, they're bringing you there for a reason and they're going to expect that you deliver something while you're there. So you cannot enter that room and be a passenger. You've got to enter that room and produce something. And so he's like, you know, just be aware that each of those opportunities that you grab, um, you're you're expected to deliver and to give something. So, yeah, this, be brave. Get out there. Practice. Get your feet wet. If you don't like it, you know, try something different. And if you like it, then grow within that that pathway or that uh, organization. There's a lot more work to do than people doing the work. So I think the opportunities are definitely there. That's a beautiful, beautiful example, Lisa. Thanks for sharing it. I think it's important for um, all of us as a group to, to share these um, opportunities that we have with as, as many people as possible. That's what allows the growth of the future generations. So before we go to our last um, plan question, I'd like to take an attendee question and pose it to all the panelists. Um, do you feel that your day-to-day -day responsibilities have taken a back seat to leadership in any way. I can answer. I, I honestly don't feel like they ever did. I kind of always kind of pushed the leadership stuff to later in the day, work weekends. Um, I always kind of put patient care as a priority. Um, and I did have in my, when I was doing a lot of, involved in a lot of the leadership roles, I was at a smaller center that did have more flexibility and a smaller volume. So it was a little bit easier um, to navigate. That's a really good question. And I think from my side, the honest answer would be probably yes. There are moments when like my day-to-day -day work wasn't 100%, maybe it was only 80% because there were so many competing priorities. At the end of the day, I would say the, the leadership roles took more of a hit than the patient care roles. But yeah, like when the rubber hits the road, occasionally, if you've got more to do than time to do it, it's going to have an impact. So be very careful about that. Yeah, and I'll, you know, also follow up with what Lisa said earlier and what she was just saying just now. I feel like for me, I really owe it to my colleagues to really help out when there are those things. You know, as I was finishing up my last question, one of my team was texting me. I don't know if you guys heard it ding, but, you know, and I thought, oh, I need to forward this to Allie to answer this clinical question. And so, you know, I do think that there are, you know, your colleagues, if, if you are lucky enough to have fellow transplant pharmacy colleagues that can really help you if you 
are in a position in which you can't get to those immediate patient care things right at the time. And I think along with that, communication is absolutely key with your team members. We typically each morning have a, a more or less morning huddle, at least for kidney transplant clinic, to, to go over what meetings we have uh, and make, ensure that patient care is uh, addressed appropriately and that the, our patients are receiving the best care and that it's not being um, compromised by, by any means, but also acknowledging that these initiatives and meetings that we're all working on, uh, whether it's within the transplant center or on a national level, really that, that primarily the goal is to improve patient care overall in, in the long term. So it's the, the short game versus the long game. Um, but if you look at the initiatives for most of our national committees, really the, the goal at hand is improving patient care, like hands down. Um, whether it be um, uh, public policy, improving medication access, et cetera. And one thing I'd like to add, even though those conflicts pop up every now and then, I think if you look at the big picture, being involved in some of these committees and leadership roles brings back more to your center and to your patients and to your practice than what it drains away from. So you you definitely gain more than than you invest, I would say. That's very good insight. Okay. So as we move to the final question, we've got about eight more minutes. So um, I would encourage the um, attendees to post questions if you like as we're um, preparing to finish up, but uh, we'll start from the top, Lindsay. What has been the most rewarding part of your pharmacy leadership experience? You know, it's hard for me to think about just one thing. I think some of the obvious things are when your collaborative ideas from your committee come together and come to fruition and seeing that, you know, happen. So Barrett talking about meta access and public policy and, you know, Lisa being really heavily involved in that aspect um, and seeing some of those things change at the, you know, government level at the national level is pretty cool. Um, but I think, you know, other things that have been really rewarding have been learning from others, interacting and meeting with different disciplines from different areas of the country that I maybe hadn't been able to before. So specifically in AST's um, community education committee, I'm the only pharmacist. So that's another rewarding aspect is I feel like I can represent us as transplant pharmacists on the CIOP planning committee, on the community education committee. And so I feel a little bit more pressure to speak up and do a decent job because I feel like I'm representing pharmacists um, and transplant pharmacists in that capacity. So I feel like those, you know, three things are kind of the biggest overarching um, things that have been most rewarding to me. Excellent. Um, Barrett? Yeah, I think the, the professional relationships are are huge, um, and, and that network that you develop with uh, professional activities. I, I think the initiatives we've been able to work on um, over years and years, it's amazing to see all the progress that's been made. We now have board certification, just finished sitting for the, the first round of examination that was decade, over a decade in, in the works to be recognized by BPS as a, a specialty. Um, it, the immuno bill, it, I mean, the list goes on these very large initiatives, but I think that the most rewarding is seen, being, actually seeing this expansion of transplant pharmacy services um, and move to different arenas, uh, the expansion in the ambulatory care setting. Uh, for a lot of institutions, additional positions being approved, and that recognition with our uh, colleagues within transplant of the, the worth of the transplant pharmacist. I kind of alluded to it earlier too, but I, I think that's really been the most exciting over the past 10 years to, to see that growth. And Lindsay mentioned being on uh, the AST committee. I mean, uh, fellow symposium just occurred too. I believe uh, Rita was the first transplant pharmacist uh, who did fellow symposium, and then it was 
uh, Kristen, and now I think we've expanded to five transplant pharmacist faculty um, for that program, uh, which is just outstanding to see. Excellent. Kristen? I would say I kind of echo everything that Lindsay and Barrett have said. Most notably are the collaborations that I've been able to kind of work on with pharmacists and other providers from across the country. I think through those collaborations, you learn new and unique perspectives when I, I personally have been somebody that was at only two centers um, and you kind of know the way we do things at these two centers, but learning more about what everybody else is doing and how that differently can impact patient care. I agree with kind of Barrett's point, or it was Lindsay that mentioned the, the CIOT planning committee. I would say probably one of the most rewarding committees I was on also was the ATC planning committee, just because we were able to bring the vision of what our community of practice really wanted to see for education for not only for our community for transplant pharmacists, but also to show what transplant pharmacists can provide on a larger scale for education for the entire AST. So I think being part of that, as well as fellows, um, were definitely the most personally rewarding um, committees that I've been on. But I think it's really the connections um, that I've been able to make for networking and learning from other people that is really the most valuable piece of being involved with AST leadership. That's great. Lisa? For me, the most rewarding part is actually affecting change and seeing things happen as a result of these efforts. So some very specific examples. Several years ago, Medicare Part B said that you can no longer deliver medications to hospital environments. That would have been devastating for pretty much all of our hospitals and how we educate patients before they leave. So, you know, ran a survey created the literature that proves how transplant programs function, and then through AST formally re refuted that, that decision and got it reversed. So being able to like design a response to a very specific thing and have it succeed, that's amazing. Um, the immuno bill was passed last year. We have yet to see how that's going to play out in terms of what it feels like and what it costs like, but that's a massive step forward. And um, a third example is, you know, having identified the problem with the off-label and non-compendia supported denials through the Medicare D plans, um, shining a light on that problem, both with evidence, with our case series, and then with lots of articles and editorials. And now seeing that the compendia have changed their language for mycophenolate, tecrolimus now has an FDA approval for tecrolimus. I mean, we can see that these identifying these specific problems and taking very targeted action is actually affecting change in the field. And I think that's just super, it gets me so jazzed. <laughs> that's awesome. So we're getting close to the end of the hour and I would like to address the last attendee question that I have to the entire group of panelists. What opportunities or decisions do you wish you would have take, um, wish you took advantage of early in your career? That's a good question. I guess for me, I would, something that I haven't done, but it would be really nice to do, and I think it's kind of hard to do at this point, but never impossible, would be just to visit colleagues in their practice, in their hospitals, to see different models of transplant pharmacy practice. Obviously, I know like how the model is where I have trained and where I have worked in the past, but there are some pretty cool things happening that I don't I don't fully appreciate. So I think like a little exchange program of sorts to go see other transplant pharmacist models across the U.S. I think would be really informative and really interesting. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Lisa. That would be a, a great opportunity. I think at my current center, I've learned about more leadership and management type training opportunities. I didn't do a formal HPSA residency or anything of the sort for any management skills, um, but taking more of those classes early on in my career to learn about different management styles, management strategies, um, all of that probably would, could have been helpful as well. But I think every hospital has those opportunities. Sometimes if you're, you just have to figure out where they are and spend the time doing those.
Baird or Lindsay, would you like to come in and close it? I don't know if I have any specifics. I, I think kind of hindsight's 2022, it, especially when thinking about these national committees we have. It's sometimes I, I think back, it's like, hey, why didn't we do this earlier? <laughs> Some of these yeah. committees. It's like, yeah, it makes sense. Um, and it, everything works out for, I, I think, a specific reason and it evolves. But um, it's, it, once again, hindsight's 2020. Yeah, I don't really have um, anything anything to add. You know, when initially you asked the question, Rita, I was thinking, actually, no, I probably, there probably isn't anything. And then hearing Lisa and Kristen and, and now Barrett, I'm like, actually, yeah, those those would have been really good things um, to, have, to have thought about. I feel like I didn't really get that involved in professional organizations or at least, you know, further in, in the higher um, chair positions and those sort of things until later in my career. I mean, really, it was after I moved from Barnes Jewish to, to Tampa. So eight years into my career. But I feel like that's that's what worked out for me. You know, I started slow with the, the work groups and the committees and really learned what was going on, um, you know, Really, my first exposure to AST transplant pharmacy community of practice was when Kristen was chairing the online community of practice, and I remember being like, "Gosh, I, I didn't even know about this. What are they? What am I even supposed to be doing or contributing?" And then I ended up taking over as chair of that of that committee, and so I feel like I was a little bit slower, but I wouldn't have, you know, thinking back on it, I don't think I would have done it any other way because that's what worked for me at the time. So um, thank you so much for um, all of those comments. And I, I just, I hope that I echo the, the attendees of the meeting in terms of how valuable it was to all of us, myself included. And I just would personally like to reiterate that as pharmacists, ACCP is our home professional organization. And we um, have selected other maybe um, specialty organizations such as AST that a lot of you have heard us refer to and different things like that is our transplant home organization. But I would just like to reiterate and remind you something. The first AST meeting, I mean ATC meeting that I went to, I don't believe that there was another pharmacist there. If there were, I didn't know them. And now we go to all of our meetings and we see how many transplant pharmacists there are and how much the field has grown. And I hopefully that shows to you all the potential opportunities that there are out there for pharmacists in a variety of different fields. And such as those opportunities grow, so do leadership opportunities. And I include you to take advantage of those. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Eric, do you want to close? Okay, hearing well, I nothing, think we're um, good. I'll thank you. Okay, just remind everybody that the slides will be posted um, on the website, ATCP website. And again, we appreciate very much your attendance. Thank you. And thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Bye, thank you.